Over these past many months now, we've had a great deal of criticism for America's eighth president and one of your average libertarian's favorites. Martin Van Buren fearlessly advanced one of the strongest laissez-faire agendas in our history. Yet, he did it at the expense of minorities and moral principles. He wanted a streamlined and small government, but he also wanted it run by party bosses like himself. So what to do with this man, this supposed free soiler, this American Talleyrand? For a little help in making a full assessment, I've invited Jeffrey Rogers Hummel on the show. Jeff has a PhD in history from UT Austin, and his book, Emancipating Slaves, Enslaving Free Men, remains the most important and best libertarian treatment of the period to date. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. Okay, so Jeff Hummel, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, and I, I want to, since you are the guy, you are the guy out there among libertarians who made us start thinking about Martin Van Buren as one of our choices for a great president or a good president at least, um, the best president in some people's view. Um, so today, I, I wanted to invite you on so that we could have a wide assessment of Van Buren, the man, the politician, the president, the partisan, the ideologue, uh, perhaps, if that's your view. Um, I wanted to get you on to have a real full and complete assessment of what exactly we do with this guy, Martin Van Buren, as, as libertarians. Um, so now, through the course of the interview, I think I'm probably going to, let's say, play the wiggery to uh, your strong dose of democracy, because I know right. I know you're a fan of Van Buren, but I, I want to be the devil's advocate um, uh, and advocate for the Whigs here. Uh, <laughs> so okay, first, well, let me let me just clarify. Um, I would rather characterize him as the least bad president in, <laughs> in history. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, that, that... Especially in libertarian terms. You know, let's start there because I, I uh, was talking with one of my professors in grad school about this. He's a, a Marxist and sort of a hardcore one at that. Um, and he doesn't like any American presidents either. And so I was asking, well, who is your favorite? And, and he just kind of looked at me quizzically like, why bother choosing one? Um, they're all so bad. Why? Why pick one? So let me ask you. Uh, what, you know, why Van Buren? Well, let me answer the first question. Why do you pick one? And the answer is that, I mean, you can have these set of principles, whether they're Marxist principles or libertarian principles, uh, and by those extreme standards, uh, nearly uh, all political figures are going to fail. But that sort of ignores the significant differences between, you know, someone like uh, Adolf Hitler and someone like Martin Van Buren. So everything goes by degrees. And I think as historians, um, we should be um, sensitive to these distinctions because they're the stuff of history. And of course, in current politics, right? You, I mean, there may be cases where there are um, there's no significant difference between the options you face, but very often there are important differences, and um, uh, I end up supporting what I consider to be the least bad alternative. So now, before we launch into talking details about his political career, uh, let's start with just what what sort of person was Van Buren. Uh, because historians today, for example, make a lot of the fact that Van Buren was, in some ways at least, considered America's first ethnic president uh, because he was he was from an old Dutch family in New York and, and from an area of the country that was very culturally Dutch, which marked him as you know somebody ethnically distinct from the Anglo-Saxons that, that predominated elsewhere. Um, what about Van Buren's personal life? You know, the... well, he was, you're right. He was born um, in upstate New York in 1782. He was Dutch. By the way, he was born coincidentally close to where I was born. Uh, 
And um, he was actually born of, uh, from a humble family. Uh, he wasn't, his family was not part of the political elites at the time. Uh, he trained as a lawyer uh, and he started his career primarily defending the tenants uh, in upstate New York or in actually all along the Hudson River Valley because as you know that was an area where you still had a vestige of uh, a landed feudal elite. Uh, he was um, affable, <laughs> uh, he was well-dressed, um, and he was politically wily, uh, which are characteristics that nearly everyone points out about him uh, on the personal level. Did he stand out in any of those ways from the majority of his countrymen? Well, um, I wouldn't say, I mean, you know, there was great variation. So uh, I wouldn't say that he, he had a reputation for being more politically sophisticated, uh, more politically effective, and more politically manipulated. I believe that's a bit overplayed. And to the extent that it's true, it's true in his early career, but it's not true in his later career. In other words, he takes a lot of principled stand, but stands both as president and after president, that if he was only interested in um, a political aggrandizement, uh, they were obvious mistakes. For instance, his position on Texas, um, uh, in the, uh, the uh, election in which Polk is eventually uh, chosen as president. So, so I, I don't think he's uh, significantly outside of the mainstream on any of the characteristics that are normally identified by historians. What I think is the one characteristic in which he is outside uh, significantly outside the diversity of politicians is in how principled he was and how consistent he was, which is not to say that he was perfectly consistent, um, but I think that he was uh, uh, more, more, consistent, li more consistently uh, classical liberal uh, than any other anti-Balum, any other successful antebellum politician that I can think of. No, I, in, in your essay on Van Buren, uh, the, your famous essay from Reassessing the Presidency, you, uh, you compare Calhoun and Van Buren in a way that I think is really great because both of these men were sort of aristocratic in terms of Jacksonian America at least. They liked, like you said, to, to dress nice and to have nice things. Uh, Calhoun, especially being a great planter, you know, had had that going in in uh, in the extreme. Um, but you call Calhoun the swaggering opportunist from South Carolina, and you you compare him to Van Buren, with Van Buren coming out favorably. Um, and now I, I think there's a lot to that because I I can't stand Calhoun, uh, but I but I at least I understand Van Buren, and I feel like I understand where he's coming from, and it actually is a pretty good place. Um, so, without digging too much into Calhoun, can you first tell me what what are your problems with Calhoun? Well, the first problem is the obvious one that everyone has a problem with, and that is the extent to which he is pro-slavery. But I think he switches positions um, more often than any other major politician in the era. Era. Remember, he starts out as a nationalist. Uh, a war hawk supporting the War of 1812. Uh, he becomes uh, a Secretary of War during the Monroe years, and at that stage, he's still incredibly nationalistic, uh, wants to build up the uh, military, uh, and, uh, and then eventually he shifts uh, and becomes more states' rights oriented. Uh, he switches parties back and forth, um, you know, supporting uh, the Jacksonian coalition and breaking with it and supporting it again. I think, um, I think a lot of his uh, political moves 
are connected with his political, uh, are, are the source of which, the source of them is his political ambition. Mm -hmm. And now, I think he makes a great foil for Van Buren because the, the debate among historians about Van Buren seems to really come down to, was he an ideologue, like a, a Jeffersonian Republican ideologue, or was he really this, this uh, <laughs> uh, red fox from Kinderhook, this little magician who creates this new second party system so he can be the great puppet master and he, he created something new. Um, he wasn't trying to protect this Jeffersonian Republican vision. Now, I think you tend toward the, the Jeffersonian Republican side of, of Van Buren, um, but clearly that is not what Calhoun is all about. You know, Calhoun is clearly a self-serving person desperate for the presidency. Uh, yes. So can yeah. you tell us, how is Van Buren, tell us how he really can be seen as an ideologue? Well... I mean, basically, he takes a, um, you know, a Republican uh, with a small r position throughout most of his career, starting with his legal practice. And then when he gets involved uh, in politics in New York and organizes the Bucktails, that's the more radical faction, uh, the more liberal faction of uh, the very factionalized Republican Party of New York State. Uh, when he's elected to the Senate in 1821, he's alarmed at uh, all of the uh, sellouts of Republican principles that have resulted from the War of 1812. And he makes a pilgrimage to Jefferson at Monticello and uh, to other politicians in order to try to put together a new nationwide uh, Republican alliance. And he, his efforts eventually, of course, bring about the creation of the Democratic Party, united behind uh, Andrew Jackson, who was elected president in 1828. And he sees the Democratic Party, I think, as a party of republicanism uh, and also as a party reflecting uh, the majority uh, uh, interests of the population. Um, after all, they refer to themselves as the democracy. And what I think is interesting about Jefferson, uh, pardon me, about Van Buren compared with Jefferson is um, Van Buren is one of those rare cases of someone who's actually more consistent when he's president <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, than he was before. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's clearly the opposite uh, with someone like Jefferson. Can you tell us what was the purpose of the political party system that he set up? Because uh, I think one one historian, uh, biographer of Van Buren, put it perfectly when he said, "You know, calm and stability were not normal elements in his world," and he knew that. So, what was what was the purpose of a political party? Well, I I think he. Part of the re well, one author has suggested. I think it's uh, Silby has suggested that in fact he wanted political parties to try to um, uh, to to try to uh, discipline the excessive factionalism that you had, uh, for instance, during the so-called era of good feelings. So he actually thought of political parties as a calming device. But if you look at some of his later writings, there's almost a, uh, a proto-public choice analysis in his discussion of political parties. In other words, he sees that, that the two political parties are ideologically distinct, um, the Federalists and the Whigs as political parties representing what today we would call rent-seeking groups, seeking special privileges from government, uh, um, uh, and therefore beholden to elites, whereas he sees the early Republican Party and then the Democratic Party as sort of reflecting um, uh, a, a, a majority coalition against <laughs> these attempts to use governments for special privileges. So I think that's that was the role he assigned to the Democratic Party. 
And then, you know, it seems that throughout his career, he has certain moments to put that into uh, effect, you know, and and um, productively use the parties to steer the country in a good direction, you know, toward a more prosperous economy and a, a um, more liberal state here at home. Um, and, and there are other times when clearly uh, his party system has been taken over and there's something he has to do about it. Um, so I, I, I want to keep that in mind as we go through the rest of his, his career here. Now, okay. Can, can you give us a, a libertarian rundown of his presidency? Yeah, um, I would divide his uh, uh, his um, accomplishments as president into two categories: uh, domestic policy and foreign policy. Uh, foreign policy is the area where I think the president has the most leeway in determining the trajectory uh, of policy. And um, you know, uh, as I mentioned in my article. Uh, the tendency of most historians is to uh, is to um, be uh, uh, rate as great presidents, uh, presidents who show dynamic, forceful leadership, which means wartime presidents <laughs> uh, dominate the list of uh, the mainstream lists of greatest American presidents, whereas Van Buren. Um, has the distinction of avoiding uh, two potential wars during his presidency. Uh, he wanted to definitely avoid war with Mexico over the issue of Texas, uh, which is why he, uh, he uh, is opposed to annexing Texas during his presidency, uh, tries to negotiate with uh, or actually does st start to set up negotiations with Mexico, which never re recognized uh, Texas independence. And of course, this uh, part of his uh, stance uh, continues uh, after his presidency. And then, of course, as you well know, <laughs> there were uh, border disputes uh, with uh, Britain over Canada, uh, first over the revolts in Upper and Lower Canada, uh, which could have resulted in war because Americans were crossing the border um, trying to get <laughs> to support those revolts. And then, of course, the uh, dispute over the border uh, between Maine and New Brunswick. And in, uh, in, in both of those cases, uh, Van Buren actually goes against uh, what would have been politically uh, more opportune um, in order to try and resolve those conflicts and prevent them from resulting in war. And I think that's a, a significant accomplishment with respect to his foreign policy. And just for a, for a second to uh, expand on that a bit, um, it's especially interesting to me because as, as you uh, started hinting there, you know, we've covered the Canadian situation a lot on, on the show before and there were Van Buren men, his most radical supporters were the, the ones forming up on, in companies uh, of militiamen to invade Canada. And uh, they were crossing the, the Great Lakes and stuff and invading Canada and fighting it out with the British here and there. And um, <laughs> Van Buren is just sitting in Washington wondering, oh, my God, what am I going to do with these people? You know, <laughs> right, uh, right. these bunch yeah, of yahoos and, I got this, out there. This is one of the factors that uh, cost him uh, his reelection because he, he um, lost those northern uh, votes in those uh, northern tiers of uh, of normally Democrat, uh, democratic uh, counties. Mm -hmm. Now, so we can count his non-interventionism certainly as a plus for libertarians when assessing his record. But what do you, what do you say about the idea that, well, he may have had some principled reasons to avoid the war, but really he was concerned first and foremost about keeping peace between the sections, between slaveholding and non-slaveholding interests. And he didn't want to annex Northern Territory because it would be free, and that would upset the slaveholders and imbalance the Senate. And he didn't want to annex Texas because it would upset the Northerners and unbalance the Senate. And then we couldn't have any politics as usual. So, I mean, wouldn't that make? I don't see. I don't see a lot of evidence 
for your former claim. I mean, the claim about Texas is definitely true, but uh, the Southerners were um, on board during the War of 1812 <laughs> with trying to annex Canada, uh, right? Jefferson yeah. and Madison. When, when there was no, when there was no uh, abolition and, movement. And so I don't see any significant evidence. And in fact, you know, actually Congress does – um, authorize a, a militia mobilization during this period uh, a, 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 in the, a, with the prospect of, uh, of going to war. And I don't know of any significant um, uh, Southern objection to that. Maybe Calhoun. I'd have to look, at, look into whether, what Calhoun was saying at the time. But, um, but so I don't think that uh, unless, unless there's Evidence that you know of that I haven't seen. I don't see any evidence supporting that interpretation of his actions. Well, I haven't necessarily seen it from Van Buren's pen, let's say, um, but I've read that from a couple historians trying to interpret uh, opposition to expansion. And I, I know from my master's, I read a lot of Southern newspaper editorials and letters to the editor of people talking about the Canada rebellions and saying, well, we shouldn't have anything to do with that uh, because we don't want that Northern Territory anyways. Um, and they instead say, well, Texas is really what we want. Canada is pretty useless. It's a wasteland. Texas, however, is a great, uh, important country, and we certainly don't want Britain to get a new place on the map. So Texas is where it's at. But Van Buren is trying to tread this line between both of them and say, no, no expansion, not during my years. I'm not interested in that. It's going to agitate things too much. Um, and or at least that's the that's the uh, hopes that let's say newspaper writers seem to project onto his administration. You know, right, um, right. But do you think if war broke out? I mean, some of his advisors actually said you need to provoke a war to get reelected. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! <laughs> and you think if war actually broke out, that would have hurt him politically or helped him politically? Yeah. See, uh, it's it's very hard for to to disentangle. I think so. It, it does incline me to say he probably had pretty principled reasons to just stay out of it. Right. Um, but nonetheless, it's you know I don't I don't want to ever be accused of giving a president too much credit. So. <laughs> right. right. Okay. Well, so there are cases where principle and expediency expediency. Uh, coincide right, it's especially if you're a particularly clever politician, right? Right. You can make those two things coincide much more often than other people can. Um, so let's get to domestic policy. Yes, right? please. So I think um, domestically, uh, he, his most important actions were uh, his response to the Panic of 1837, and then the. Uh, Subsequent deflation from 1839 to 1843, which essentially was a non-interventionist program. And not only was it a non-interventionist program in which he attempted to cut expenditures uh, while refusing to um, do anything to increase taxes. And by the end of his administration, he was uh, successful uh, at doing that. Uh, opposed uh, government, uh, any government uh, relief efforts, but actually moved to the radical hard money wing of his party uh, by supporting the independent treasury, uh, the divorce of bank and government, which at least initially was um, didn't work politically to his advantage because initially it splits the democratic coalition uh, between the hard money advocates and uh, the group that became known as the conservatives. And, um, you know, so I think that uh, is, is not politically motivated. It's more ideologically motivated and it has enormous benefits. One of the things that I would have, emphasized more if I were rewriting my defense, my article defending Van Buren um, today, is his blocking of Henry Clay's attempts to use the distribution of, of surplus to um, bail out uh, states, 
uh, as a result of the, the second uh, uh, financial or uh, economic uh, crisis, the deflation from 1839 to uh, 1843, you had um, uh, four states repudiating their debts, uh, four others defaulting on their debts, and even New York and Ohio are coming close to doing so. And Clay wants to use what today we call revenue sharing, but was then referred to as the distribution of the surplus to bail out the states. And of course, Van Buren puts the Democratic Party solidly behind doing anything about that. And um, one of the things that I don't emphasize enough in the article is, um, I mean, I do mention it, but is the benefits it had at the state level. Uh, because as a result of this fiscal crisis at the state level, uh, you had two thirds of the states rewriting their constitutions um, over the next 10 years, uh, restricting state investment in private corporations, limiting or banning uh, incorporation by special legislative act, in other words, moving to general uh, incorporation, um, altering the way the state and local governments uh, issue debt. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that um, in 2011, Tom Sargent, the Nobel Prize winning economist, <laughs> in, his, uh, in his Nobel lecture actually brought up these reforms and ask the question, how likely would these reforms have been uh, if the states had been bailed out? So this is critical in the transition of the U.S. economy at the state level from mercantilism to laissez-faire. And um, I think Van Buren deserves a lot of credit for facilitating that transition by his uh, opposition to the bailouts. I uh, I totally agree with that. I think this is the economic issues are the clearest you know examples of Van Buren being a good libertarian figure. Um, but this this pattern of being very good on economics but very bad on some other things continues in you know libertarian history, right? right. Um, we're very often willing to trade tax cuts and ignore something else, right? Uh, because at least we're getting the good economic stuff. Um, so for Van Buren, you know, this is not his his faults are not things that you ignore. You know, you talk about the Trail of Tears, the Seminole right. War in Florida, uh, Van Buren's um, <laughs> pretty terrible handling of the Amistad case, um, right. DC and uh, slavery in DC. You know, the the gag rule in Congress. Like there are all these things that are related to slavery again, related to the the conflict or potential conflict between the sections. And I, I go back to my point about well. It seems to me that more often than not, what he's really trying to do is prevent conflict so that he can uh, more easily manage business as usual. You know, And we can get things like he can give his constituency the economic stuff, um, but he has to buy it at the sacrifice of the slave's interest, basically. You know, he has to sell himself to the South in order to give his northern constituents much of what they want. Well, I, I can see that somewhat, but I think you've got to put it in perspective. If you were to take, for instance, um, the um, compromises with slavery, and you look at Northern Democratic presidents, right? <laughs> um, who's the one who compromises the least prior to the war with slavery? is Van Buren, right? Obviously not as bad as Buchanan um, I mean, or John, Pierce. John Quincy Adams even was a colonizationist, <laughs> okay. and, and, right? Well, John Quincy Adams is, is of course, the, the opposite party. And you could say that, that his opposition to slavery really comes after his presidency. Um, uh, and even with Indian removal, you know, that policy it's set in stone um, during the Monroe administration when Calhoun is Secretary of War. And during Adams' presidency, 
Um, he doesn't oppose um, uh, uh, relocating the Indian tribes. He just wants to do it in um, a, a kinder and gentler way. Right, right. Uh, um, so, so, so in other words, how much of a sacrifice was Van Buren making? How far could he have gone? Um, uh, have, how far could he have pushed those policies in a more libertarian dire direction uh, and been successful? Maybe a little bit, uh, but but I th I think you know he 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 was a, in, in order to be in office at all he had to make some compromises and and um, and I think. That's why I say he's the least bad president, but um, that's that's going to be inevitable. And I and I think he um, remember. I mean, you know, on the, on the issue of of slavery and race relations, don't forget his vice president. Yes, yes, my favorite, <laughs> uh, Richard Johnson, right? Whom. Um, becomes anathema to Southerners because he's uh, openly has uh, a black mistress and um, uh, black children who he recognizes. And this causes problems for uh, his being renominated as vice president when uh, Van Buren runs a second uh, time. And yet Van Buren uh, um, continues to, well, or let's, be very precise, refuses to dump him from the ticket. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, Richard Benter Johnson, he's he's an interesting character. And, you know, people, it, it, I only say this because you mentioned it, but um, he, that was his wife, right? Like we, yes. people called him, called her uh, his mistress and stuff, euphemisms like that. But he, that was his wife. They They were married as much as they were allowed to be, you know? Um, and in love and everything, he defended her. I think it's it's very interesting story that again we don't we don't hear too much about, and it's a shame because we should be looking more into this period in libertarian history, not just American history. You know, Van Buren is the early libertarian president, so let's let's figure out what his his years were like. Um, and, the, and the Johnson issue brings up another um, aspect of what's going on during this period. Um, the attitude of Southerners hardens against Johnson uh, from Van Buren's election to his running for re-election. And this is reflecting the fact that racial attitudes, uh, especially on the frontier, are hardening over this time. There's a tendency among historians to um, treat you know, the Democratic Party as the pro-slavery party from its um, origin. And I think that's very um, um, unfair because I think at the time that the Democratic parties and the Whig parties first emerge, they're both compromising on slavery. Uh, they're both trying to do things to hold their northern and southern wings together. Um, and there are many slaveholders in the Whig party. Uh, it's only as you move towards the Civil War with Polk's nomination as, um, as the presidential candidate uh, that, the, you know, in other words, there's this drift of the Democratic Party becoming uh, more and more pro-slavery over time rather than being the pro-slavery party throughout that entire period. And, and, and I think the Johnson... Uh, cases, uh, you know, the evolution of attitudes is a, is a manifestation of, uh, of that uh, shift. And of course, Van Buren, um, for that, re tries to stop it. Of course, he's got other other issues involved when <laughs> when he becomes the Free Soil candidate for president. Um, but um, uh, but there again, I, I I think Van Buren deserves more credit than he receives. Well, yeah, let, let's finish up there because uh, you know it, it strikes me that early on in the Loco Foco movement that we've covered so much on the show, most of them did not like Van Buren. They loved Johnson and they wanted him at the top of the ticket. And right. many, many of them didn't vote for Van Buren at all. 
Um, and he had to really work to win that radical support uh, from the fringe of his own his own party. Um, and then by 1848, most of the Free Soilers who vote in that election do it because they're Van Buren men from long ago, from a decade ago. And then in 52 and 56, Van Buren goes back to the Democratic Party. But by 1860, he's a Lincoln supporter and he right. supports the war even. So to, right. what is going on here? How do we make sense of Van Buren's free soil candidacy? On the one hand, we could say he's just trying to muscle over the Democrats and to make them, you know, knuckle under and start taking directions from him again and, you know, repudiate the the factions that came to power under Polk. And then on the other hand, how could you deny that this is an amazing expression of this early libertarian ideology? Well, it's both, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> If you talk about most politicians, I would say they're complex combinations of uh, of uh, lofty idealism and crass opportunism. <laughs> and you know, the particular mix is different with respect to politicians, different politicians, and different different with respect to politicians at certain points in time. So clearly, there is um, a mild anti-slavery strain in Van Buren's thought, uh, which he has to keep in check in order to keep the Democratic Party unified. And what happens when Polk is elected, of course, is um, <clears throat> not only does the Democratic Party swing in a more pro-slavery direction, but um, after Polk's election, of course, uh, in terms of how he handles the patronage in New York, he cuts out all of the Van Burenites, which from Van Buren's perspective, you can say uh, represents um, uh, a threat against his own uh, uh, position within the party, but it's also a threat to the party overall. Uh, in other words, violating uh, Van Buren's goal of keeping the Democratic Party uh, united. So those two things combine uh, to... Um, to make him accept the Free Soil uh, uh, presidential candidacy. And of course, by the next election, those problems, those, those patronage problems, those factional problems have been resolved. And I think um, Van Buren recognizes that the Free Soil Party is not going to accomplish much. And so he goes back to the Democratic Party. So, right, there's a mixture of, of um, ideology and expediency. And he ends up being a supporter of Lincoln's efforts in the war, it seems mainly because uh, to some degree, this is all that's left, you know, to like you, you just have to, to fight this out yeah. and, and reunify the, the country so that we can get uh, uh, back onto productive footing, you know. Uh, for Van Buren, politics was always a way to channel uh, violence and anger and distrust and everything else to channel that into peaceful, productive reform. And that just simply broke down beyond repair. Right. Well, remember that Van Buren is, it, it thinks that um, Stephen Douglas's <laughs> um, <clears throat> Kansas, Nebraska Act is a disaster. Um, which sort of orient, orients him in a Republican direction to begin with. And I think he's in the same class as the Blairs, you know, who also joined the, the Republican Party. Um, these, are, um, these, these are old Jacksonians, uh, but they have... They do have this nationalistic desire to maintain the country. And while Van Buren is perfectly willing to, um, is, is more acceptance, accepting of states' rights than Jackson is during Jackson's presidency, um, Van Buren is not going to go along uh, with disunion. And the Republican Party at that time is actually a coalition of, of um you know, Democrats and uh, former Democrats and former Whigs, and that's really the only place for him to go. One of the disappointing things about some of the abolitionists um, 
uh, and even eventually William Lloyd Garrison, is the extent to which they fall in as supporters of the of the war, of the Civil War, uh, and of Lincoln. But um, I think you have to grant them um, a little bit of, um, <clears throat> of uh, sympathy, because you know if you've got this anti-slavery cause that you've been fighting for your entire life, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, this war that is a horrible thing and you may disapprove of, actually opens up the prospect of ending this horrible system, it's easy to be tempted. Jeff Hummel is easily one of the most important libertarian historians out there today. And whatever you might come away from this thinking about Van Buren, Jeff Hummel is the person who is responsible for the Van Buren revival in libertarian thought. And I have to say, I still don't like what Van Buren was up to throughout his life. I'm still not a super huge fan, but I do understand him better. He doesn't fit my radical left libertarian anarchism very well. But all things considered, Van Buren really was one of the most important figures in the whole first half of American libertarianism. He was the loco foco president, for better and for worse. And like him or loathe him, we should all try to understand him. How else are we going to spot our own era's foxy magicians? Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.